Well, thanks for coming out. I'd love for you to go around the room and introduce yourself and tell me where you're from and a little bit about yourself. Go ahead. I'm Abe Nadimi. I'm from Dallas. Okay. Um, working on a modern business school. Modern business school. Yes. Very cool. Yes. I see there's a lot of uh, a lot of things you talk about. Yeah, I believe in it. Yes. So I wanted to make a difference and change it. So a master class that has normal people teaching the class. Yep. And uh, focus on entrepreneurship and mindset. That's the first thing that we work on. That's the thing that I want to work on teaching. But I have all this like amazing people that what I What were you doing before? Uh, had a we have a tobacco business, manufacturing tobacco hookah pipes and hookah tobacco that we sell internationally. And that's a family business. We did we've done that from 03 and I left the day to day in 2015 and then started working on consulting and then I was like family as in like a sibling my brother, or my brother started in his bedroom and then my whole family got involved in 05. So I left the flight test engineering job at Bell Helicopter to then work there with him. And I was nuts, like totally did all of that stuff. And uh, successful, landed on the Inc. 500 list and so forth. And then when I left in 2015, because I, I wanted to do something different. And wanted to do the consulting, and then I realized like this isn't like a broad impact. And so I was focusing, and, and when I was working with people, I realized like mindset was of something that was really beating up people. Mm -hmm. And so I started working that, and then finally figured out that I wanted to do business school. That's cool. So in the middle, in there Dallas? was a massive failure. It's going to be, it's all line, so, so live event. So. But I did, a, I did a mobile tech startup. I totally crashed that. And so in that concept of connectivity, though, was like, well, let me still do that. Let me just be a real life version of that. So the app was called Refer Me, and it was about connecting people. So it's really cool. So then I just bring those people and put them on camera, and I'm the backbone. I'm the platform for it. I understand. Very cool. Thanks. Nice. I'm um, Todd Bookspan. Hey, Todd. Uh, father three just had my 28th anniversary here on Friday with my wife. Congrats. From, uh, Where do you live? Phoenix, Arizona. You guys, so it was good timing. You did it in New York. Uh, flew in a day early because they they canceled our flight in you know, Wednesday, so caught the last flight out of Phoenix on, on Tuesday night. So we got lucky there. And uh, wear a couple of hats um, through, started coaching in the mortgage industry um, and other industries as well a couple of years back and developed a sales performance product for loan officers and real estate agents. That's kind of my passion now because I feel like I can impact more through that product than I can one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm here to figure out how to continue to grow that and scale it as we move forward. That's cool. So I'm Gary Mikhail Justin. I'm from Kyle. Chicago. Um, I run a company called National Corporate Credit. We raise money for startups, small businesses. I started it with a buddy of mine in 2008, right out of high school, so I didn't go to college. And uh, I've been growing it ever since. We've got a great- Good timing. Company. Good timing, yeah, good timing. So we've been building it ever since. Um, kind of been in the trenches, doing deals through a lot of JVs. Don't really have much of an influencer standpoint just yet, but that's what I'm here to learn. And okay. Yeah, man, it's good to be here. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Brian McKay. Met you a couple months ago. Yep. You did a shout out to my sister who uh, terminally ill, and my sister who doesn't complain, as my aunt would say, won't say shit with a mouthful. She, uh, her response to your video, and she's not effusive, man. She doesn't put it out there. She goes, "I'm gonna save it forever." <laughs> All right. So I'm not gonna we'll say a lot more right this second because of that. Yeah, we'll but, come back around. Yeah. Appreciate it, my man means a lot to me. Uh, Chris Clothier from uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Married with a five kids. Oof. Yeah. You guys aren't yeah. fooling around. Yeah. yeah. What are the ages? Uh, 16, 12, 8, 6, and 3. 16? Yeah. You had a baby when you were 3? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you look good, no. man, for a 16-year-old. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, he was born when I was 30. So, You're full, uh, wow, you look great. Yeah, cool. Six, one more time, 16. 16, 12, 8, 6, oh wow, 9, <laughs> 6, and 3. Amazing. Oh, she's going to get on me for that. That's <laughs> amazing, man. Good for you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We uh, own a family business okay. with my uh, father and brother. Father and brother. Tennessee, real estate investment firm. Okay. My wife and I uh, have a charitable foundation yep. that we run. Yep. Uh, one's called Kids Kicking Cancer. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other one is... Uh, charity water, mm. big uh, supporters of charity water, and um, yeah, having fun, man. We, uh, I've, I was telling somebody yesterday, I've only had one job for someone else ever since I was 17. I've worked at the family business or started my own businesses. Very cool. So this is yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. Hi, Gary. Uh, my name's Chris D. Ray. I'm from sunny Buffalo, New York. <laughs> uh, I have a newborn, so I, I'm first one. Here. Yeah, 
first Congrats. child, she'll be 22 weeks uh, wow. tomorrow. So this was like the thing for me to be here awesome. overnight flying and you know, this was like- I a, get it. Because I'm like so spinning with the girl. Uh, <laughs> I own a water uh, filtration business and um, it, you know, with my dad and it was funny because we're heating air conditioning contractors and we wanted to sell a water filtration product to our customers and we couldn't find anything that we liked. So we actually Made literally de developed our own um, Scratch system. your niche. Yeah, and uh, we then started selling the product to other heat and air conditioning contractors and plumbing contractors to let them sell it to their. And away uh, it went. And it went, and, and in the meantime, was able to get some some, some celebrity testimonials. If I can find that interesting, all uh, all celebrities of uh, customers of ours, that I didn't pay one cent for any of those testimonials. Interesting. Nice. I thought That's awesome. Appreciate that. That's very cool. And now, when you, whenever you build the best product, you win. Yeah. yeah, well, my business model is kind of flawed because now I'm relying upon a plumber who's in the house to sell the product while he's in the customer's house and to, and it's like a really tough business model. I'm aware. So what I'm looking to do is get some ideas about how I can... Go direct to consumer. Product. Yeah. I totally get it. Thank you. Hi Gary, um, I'm Mehul Rami and I'm originally from India. I moved to the U.S. in 2015 for college and uh, I think in the summer, last summer, I saw your video on Snapchat about how you scared about what people are going to do after graduating? Yes. And that completely blew my mind. And I was like, I need to know who this guy is. Yes. And what is he about? And since then, I've been following you on every platform possible. And I want my seat over here. In this I'm aware. Competition. <laughs> yes, I'm aware. Um, so pretty much <laughs> jumping. <laughs> That's cool. So it's pretty. I'm not established in any industry as of course. Right now. I'm 22. Yes. Jumping from side hustle to side hustle. Tasting. Yeah, tasting everything. Well, initially when I get when I get on any side hustle, I'm like, whoa, I'm gonna make a million dollars. Of course. The moment I get a first, I, I, the moment I get my first order, I'm like, whoa, I'm gonna make a million dollars. This is it. I'm, that's a, I'm I think that's a good trait as long as it's grounded with you're not gonna make a million dollars. Right. You know, you have to balance optimism with practicality. I think everything, I, literally every idea that runs through my head, including the two that have happened while I've been listening to you guys, <laughs> I always think is gonna be everything. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. I think to your point, and it was funny to, get to see your reaction after listening to your story, I've been talking a lot in my content right now to 20 to 25 year olds around tasting. Mm -hmm. Everybody's biggest problem is I don't know what my passion is or what I'm good at. I'm like, cool, so taste. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't know what your favorite food is, taste shit. Eat salmon, eat broccoli, eat sea urchin, eat burgers, drink, like, and we don't have that system in place. And I think for, you know, for the rest of us here that are a little further along after 22, the thing you realize is 20 to 30 is exactly when you should do high risk. Because as we start building families and other things in life happen, those are, we have to react to that. That puts us on defense. And, you know, so I've been really thinking a lot about, you know, I'm, it's funny, I'm a kid who started working literally the day I left college. Like, when I drove from Boston to New York, that night, when I got to the store around 3 or 4 p.m., because I left in the morning, I actually worked for three hours at Wine Lab, because I always worked when I was home, so it wasn't like, like, it wasn't symbolic, it was just normal, like, I got there at 4, and like, you don't go home at 4, I just got to the liquor store at 4, with the traffic, so I just, I don't know, just literally, literally parked the car, gave a huge hug to one of my best college friends who was taking a bus to the city and he was on his way to life. And I literally just like helped customers for the next three hours until dad was ready to go home and we just went home. Um, and from that day to now, I've always worked. So I didn't do, normally, 99 out of 100 times, everything you hear from me is advice that I've done on myself. So that's why I'm so confident in it. Ironically, one of my favorite pieces of advice right now is something I did polar opposite of which was because I found the meal that I became addicted to very early. But I've come to realize that wasn't the case for, and isn't the case for most. And I just think it's practical to hustle at this age, try different things. Some of us stumble upon it in an alteration of our own business. Sometimes we just bounce away from it. I mean, everybody's got their own stories of it. A young dude like this, like, you know, his business is very, condition to the market behaviors. So I'm sure he recognizes this is a good era, but it could get bad, and so what am I gonna do when it gets bad? When, you know, so there's a, you know, um, but it's great that you're tasting, and you should think everything's gonna be a million dollars. What you wanna do, though, is not get caught in a couple ways. Number one, I think a lot of people get caught on good. So where you could get caught is you could actually make 100,000 
in that first year and be like, actually this is on its way to a million but the upside was only 200,000 always. That's a very sneaky one, very hard to dissect. You know, good for the, you know, you know, alteration of, bat, of great, you know, like picking good over great. Um, but you should feel comfortable in your tasting. Right. And when do you know is the right time to like, okay, this is not gonna work for me, I gotta move on to the next thing, I, gotta, I don't have to cry about it. Nobody's that. gonna, you know, one thing I tell people is you're never gonna know the alternative. You're never gonna know that if you quit the day before, the next day was gonna be the beginning of the future. You'll never know. And that's how I live. Like, that's how I strategize. Like, the answer is it's scary. I'm convinced that there are millions of people, not millions, there's 10,000 people running around right now that were literally one day away from it clicking and they went and got another job or went back to business school or a mil- like, that's real life. And nobody wants to be that person. Like somebody watching this video is like, fuck, am I that person? That would be devastating. <laughs> right, that would be devastating. That's devastating. To me, it's a function of something else. It's a function of humility and what your aspirations are. Let me explain. The reason I'm was destined to win is the process was the win. I'd won before I started. I, being an entrepreneur was it. So to me, I never had to worry about that because I never allowed the way I lived my life and I mean expenses. Look, if you're willing to live in a studio apartment with three roommates in a ghetto neighborhood, you forever can be an entrepreneur. People only talk about the money making. Like, I'm gonna make a million. I'm always thinking like, I can live on 10,000. That keeps you in the game forever. So, so I think a lot of this has to do with what one does. You could, you could, you have the luxury of time right now. You know, hopefully you stay healthy forever and like you, you've got 80 years in front of you, minimally, with modern medicine. You got, you know, that's a lot of fucking time. And I think the only thing that can hurt you is what hurts everybody at 22. Your parents' pressure, mm-hmm. your own pressure on yourself because you see your friends starting to accomplish certain things. It was, what's that? That's, That's happening. Scary. That's happening right now. Good. So to me, I had psyche that was crazy. I loved that at 26, some of my friends were starting, my good student friends were starting to make money because they went to a good school and they went to Goldman Sachs and they were making money. Yeah. And they were buying a BMW and a watch and I fucking loved it because it, mo- it motivated me in a great way because I knew, I, I knew who I was and, and the snarky comments. And you know, now I'm Gary Vee to everybody. Let me just tell you, like, just listen very carefully. I'm 26 and I work for my dad's liquor store. Yeah. Like you gotta really understand where I was. I, I'm 26 and I'm working for my dad's liquor store. Yeah. That's, the, that's my brand amongst my circle four years out of college. Like now, because I wasn't promoting that the business was growing very rapidly, you know, um, I, you know, attaching your own happiness or sadness to somebody else's actions is the quickest way to lose. Your buddy making money has nothing to do with you. It just legitimately has nothing to do with you. Your buddy making money and getting pretty girls because of it just legitimately has nothing to do with you. I understand at 22 you want to hang out with pretty, I get it. I understand what people want in life. I understand the psyche of men, women, young, old. It all makes sense. It just doesn't have anything to do with you. And the sooner you can get to that place, I just shut everything out. Because then you can stay patient. Mindset. Yeah. But that's where people get caught. Expectation. You know? Mm -hmm. Parents pressure or trying to keep up with the Joneses. Outside forces. Hey. Hi, I'm Brooke Wood. Brooke. Um, I am 24 years old and I design websites for estheticians and beauty industry professionals. Very cool. So it's a service-based business. Yes. Um, Do you design on top of platforms? I design with Squarespace Mm -hmm. because they like to manage their own website. Makes sense. And, and it's an easy one for them to manage. Exactly, and it yep. keeps. It's I a great like platform. I'm very friendly with the, the founder of Squarespace. Squarespace. I'm a big fan. The only thing I love their platform. I'm addicted to it. And yes. Nothing could take me off of it. I hate that they don't have an affiliate program because I would be, you know. They don't need it. Exactly, <laughs> but um, no, I just wanted to come here today because it was literally I was thinking on the walk here. 
It was do you like, live here? No. <laughs> Where do you live? I live in San Diego. In San Diego. Yeah. But I was just like a year and a half ago, so like summer of 2016, like I literally couldn't afford lunch. And I, I dropped out of college three times, which was really hard because both my parents were college professors. So they were like <laughs> pushing that hard. It like wasn't for me and I knew sure. it, you know? But you were trying to make them happy. Right. I get it. Because they're good people, you know? It's like you don't do I went. I mean, I'm the most anti-college person on earth and I went to college for four years because I love my parents and like, you know, that's what they wanted. So I'm not, I, it, you know what's funny? I wasn't worried about making, I literally was checking the box. Yeah. Like I wasn't trying to, I went to Mount Ida, I was, I was checking a box for them. Yeah, I dropped out of community college three times. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> by the way, Mount Ida's below community college. So like to me, to me, to me, you know, it's funny, I'm such an optimist. I actually haven't thought about this in a long time. I, and I did say this to somebody recently, maybe you have this content, Babin. I literally converted it into vacation. I viewed it as my last vacation. I knew that I was gonna be a workaholic, because I already was. And I literally just transformed my mind and said, this is gonna be, I didn't go to camp. I didn't hang out in high school or junior high, because I worked all the time. I was like, this is just, that, that's what I did. Anyway, nonetheless, so you dropped out three times and then a year and a half ago you couldn't afford lunch and then? And then I was started listening to your content and it totally like, you know, just your message of getting your act together, do the right thing, work hard. It was just like, duh, you know? So I started just doing random, I have always had like an eye for design and so mm -hmm. I had random things. I learned Photoshop literally through YouTube videos. That's like, exactly right. Eight hours a day, just like. Yep. And then I would take on projects that I knew I wasn't qualified for but I just like learned on the go. Yes. But now it's like, it's turned into a six-figure business today, and so I'm just like, I just wanna thank you. That's awesome. You should thank yourself. There's a lot of people consuming my content. You did something with it. Mm -hmm. It's cool, thank I'm so glad you're here. I'm uh, Niles from Chicago, 35. Yes, nice. uh, I started in advertising when I was 21, and uh, basically got fired on my birthday, and my boss called At me. At an agency? Uh, it was uh, radio, direct marketing, direct mail. Mm -hmm. uh, we do, you know, we could do the creative, yep. and all that stuff. And uh, basically, my boss called me. Fire, you know, I went out the night before. He called me, fired me on my birthday. I'm like, look, give me two days. Uh, I've got a bunch of leads. I'm working. Let me come in and, and show you that I can close you know, yep. the deals I have that I'm working. Come in the next day, and then ever since that day, came back, literally closed all those deals. Um, stayed in advertising for probably a good part of eight years. Um, you know, was was top you know salesman 24 months in a row, crushed all their records, and, and uh, ultimately just started. Did you need that push when you got I, fired? I think I did. Yeah. I think I probably. Super did. interesting. Yeah, I think I probably did. Yep. Uh, maybe it was something I was looking for. You know what's funny? I'm the reason I asked you that in a in a kind of like in a thoughtful way of what was going through my mind is I'm fascinated by talent. I'm fascinated by school. Like I'm just fascinated that I did nothing for 12 years. Me. Makes no sense. This doesn't make sense. You know, like it, it just and it, it kind of like if you're that good of a salesman, but you weren't performing before, right. it's interesting that that's what mm. was the trigger. That was yeah, that was the trigger. You know, mm. and and I think people get motivated by different things. Like I don't, I'm ve I do not get motivated by negativity at all. Firing, like when clients, like when clients call, even when I need it. Like my whole life, like even when I was tiny, like baseball card, like as a kid, lemonade, like if you do, like I go the other way. I'm not, I'm motivated by, uh, you know, I, and everyone's motivated by different things and just like understanding that is fascinating to me. I think it's predicated on talent. Right. Like when you have talent, you're subconsciously understanding things. Like it, it doesn't make any sense to me that what I'm about to tell you is true. No third grader should be sitting in class and realizing this makes no sense and will not impact my life. You shouldn't have that level of wisdom or thought, like that should not, like I can't wrap my head around that that's what I, I actually did that. Like who knows what words I used, I'd like to think they were, I, I assume they were different words, but like, so like the fact that you could sell that well but weren't and somebody saying you're fired, then just was, that was it, is cool and interesting. Yeah, anyway, exactly. nonetheless. Like, I don't give a shit, you know, you know too bad. Right. You show up. Yeah. You're supposed to be here at 9 o'clock. Yeah. You're done. And you finagled your way to so give by 48 hours. He hung up. He was pissed. And yeah. I called him back. I was like, look, I get it. You know, you're right. He's like, I don't give a, you know, it's yeah. your, your birthday. Yeah. He's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I'm like, look, I got, I got a ton of leads in the system. Give me two days. If I can't close anything, I'm gone. Uh, ultimately, I ended up closing all of those. 
I ended up climbing the ropes all the way to manager, so cool. then VP, then partner. It's a cool story. So you were there for eight years and then what? Uh, did you do your own thing? Okay. And, uh, they launched a separate division out in Scottsdale. Went there for two years. It's probably 2007, 2008. And then ultimately it was just, nobody was working out there. You know, there was no growth. I, <laughs> By the way, it's so funny. I have the funniest point of view on Arizona and San Diego. Okay, so I grew up in Arizona. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a, Arizona's way better. San Diego freaks me out. Like I go there, it freaks me out. I go there and all the entrepreneurs there, I'm like, I'm like, literally I enter, first of all, it's the most, I don't know if anybody's been there, it's really the nicest place on earth. It's super nice and it's so chill. It's so, like, I feel like New York's starting to get even slow for me. So I'm like, do I need to move to China? Like, like I'm like looking for the action and San Diego freaks me the fuck. I get there and I'm like, this. You know, like, ugh. It's, it's like, I know so many of my entrepreneurial friends live there now because the lifestyle's so great. It's funny, it's funny. <laughs> I'm, uh, where I was going is actually a compliment. Anybody who's actually really working hard in that environment, really I give a lot of credit to because it's just so easy to get sucked. I get sucked into nice weather. Like when I'm in LA like for three days on business, by the third day I'm like, right, I need to get the fuck out of here before this tricks me, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so basically uh, after that, you know, there was nothing going on. Right. Right. I mean, nobody right. was working, it was yeah. happy hour every day. Yeah. And I'm like, it was such a boring town to me. Yeah. Everything shut down after 10 o'clock. And this is the Delta from Chicago. Right. Which I think is like yeah. tier two by a landslide. <laughs> Go ahead. And then uh, so I ended up just moving back, right? It's, it sold my shares and say, you know what, this is not for me. There's no more growth left. Yep. Moved back and then launched kind of a, a similar type of Makes ad sense. agency for about two years. Um, it, you know, it was getting a little bit of traction. And then one of my old buddies that I used to work with was in real estate. So he ultimately said, hey, I've got a great idea. We can launch a brokerage. I've got all the way the leads work and all of that. So I said, all right, let's give it a shot. So we gave it a shot, and ended up leaving, you know, closing down the ad firm, going full force into, into the real estate. That you know, partner ended up not working out, so ultimately just had to you know, pick up the pieces, and, and we grew the brokerage to about 40, 45 agents, uh, but our overhead was, uh, was like 20, 25 grand a month. It was just killing us. People were ordering stupid office supplies. It was, just, it was retarded. Like, it was, it was like, you know, what are we doing? We need, to, we need a clean house and basically just find some rock stars, be a boutique shop. So we did that um, over the years, and ultimately now we're about 14, 15 agents, uh, but all super seasoned, able to kind of dumb it down to more of like a true boutique shop where, you know, you know, you want to work with a big shop, you can, but yep. ultimately we're going to give you better service, you know, a more personal touch, et cetera, et cetera. And I use all my knowledge from the advertising world to be able to apply it to real estate because the system was really broken. I thought, in my opinion, it's you know, 95% of the agents, in my opinion, are incompetent and just honestly don't know what they're doing. So that later brought me into launching the startup that I'm working on now, which is interesting. I think one of your guys that works for you, Gabe, you pulled them out of it. You said it was dog, sh dog shit or something like that and, and whatever. It's similar. It's not transaction management, but it's more data driven. So ultimately, it's, it's a platform where it allows a broker not to be incompetent, where it has all of the data in there preloaded for them, but it also helps them with training. Um, and I it's a SaaS business? It is, yeah. Um, so that's where I'm at now. Very cool. The business is still going. Great. Um, and I'm in the third stage of development with the, with the cool. platform. Well, great. Um, let's just do Q and A. We're here to hang out. Who's got a question? I want to tell you. Please. You know, uh, I, I manage Brian again. I'm still Brian. Yep. Figured. <laughs> we, uh, we, I manage a real estate office for Berkshire Hathaway, broker manager, about 60 agents, about 40. Um, live ones, We're about three hours north of here. And Gino Bafari and uh, Chris Stewart are the ones that hooked me up with that NFL thing we were at. And uh, I had to, because Gino's way up there on the evolutionary scale, he yes. told me, if I leave here without telling you this, find another place. I love it. He said he would have had you, had Vayner on board a year earlier as our marketing firm. And he said, uh, I had to put the executive who was in charge of that decision in my NFL. I said, what is that? He goes, not for long section. And he said, it was, he goes, let him know it wasn't a group decision. This was a mandate from me, he said on a Sunday, a couple of weeks ago. So you got a big fan. And I, I know it, I know that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've been in business long enough to know how this stuff works. You have to understand, what I do for a living always is not what 
people on defense want to hear. Okay. The most remarkable part of VaynerMedia and its success is I haven't been selling anything anybody wants yet. The most remarkable part of this company, you probably know this the best coming from a little bit more of that world, VaynerMedia is selling to a group of people, biggest companies in the world, Budweiser, Chase, services and strategies that nobody in upper management or senior management or super senior management believes in. Mm-hmm. So the reason I know that's the case is because I've spent time with Gino and like he's an entrepreneur, yeah. right? And he's yeah. like, let's talk about the 49ers and I talk yeah. about the Jets and like, and when we left there, I looked at one of my employees and said, we're gonna get this account. And they're like, why do you think? I'm like, because he's gonna force it. That's exactly right. And I believe that. He made the decision, he said this wasn't, a, yeah. And, that, and that's how things happen at Vayner. Like I let the team do tons of shit. I don't even know what's happening, it's a big company. Yeah. But when I know something's happening, it's not gonna be a group decision. You, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, yeah, if I'm involved, I'm gonna assess it yeah. and decide. Yep. Yep. And, and, and what I mean by that is, if it's something important that nobody else would support. And he sees the, he sees the light in it. 100%. Yeah. It's also just, he's smart. You know, you know I, I always say, I always, like my life has been super interesting over the last 10 years where other people have been involved outside the customer. Like my life is basically about the customer. Like this is interesting with you. This is your business right now. Right. Like the thought of being at the mercy of a fucking plumber is not interesting. Not because it's a plumber and I'm shitting on a plumber or a real estate agent, it's that you're dealing with somebody else who has other financial vested interests and ambitions. If you've got a passive plumber who's wrapping it up soon and is super happy with his or her life, like there's just not, you know, doesn't care how much money they're gonna make on the referral fee. Yep. Doesn't want to have the extra conversation, wants to get home. Where's the fire? It's just, you know, and by the way, you'll, you'll enjoy this, and this is a little bit of a curveball. I don't need everybody to be on fire. Mm-hmm. Like I think people are confused, like I'm motivational in the fact that it's a manifestation of my optimism. Like I, you know, like I don't, like, that's why I haven't built the business you're building. Like, I don't need everybody to, like, I just want people to be practical. I'm super not anything else. It's why I've already, made, if you pay attention, like, it's why I've made a reference to you already about like, hey, brother, please make sure you're paying attention every day to the macroeconomic climate, because that's your vulnerability. That's practical. That's, I'm just practical, I'm far more immigrant than I am motivational speaker. Like, if you really dissect me, it's just about staying alive and paying your bills. <laughs> like, like and, and doing it in a way that, like, if you're gonna do that, doing it in a way where it's like fun to wake up in the morning versus not. But, 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 it's not, but I don't need everybody, like, for example, a lot of our businesses, like, you know, maybe they're not as scalable. But like, who gives a, f- like to me, here's where it gets to its basic form. Like, you know how many people can build a six-figure business? A lot less than people think. So I hate, this is, and I'm glad you just made that, actually you just made my day. Like, uh, yeah you, uh, uh, and maybe you didn't even react this way, and maybe I'm, like, I don't, I think that, especially if you're under 25 right now, this notion that everybody has to, like, the fact that almost every entrepreneur right now under 30 thinks that a million dollar revenue business is like where it starts. Right, like, like this thought of like, I'm gonna build a trillion, like when, why you got caught is you entered the land of trillion dollar businesses. Like, you're not building the next Instagram. You're not building, like, like people don't get it. Like there's like 18 of them. And everybody's like, I'm, you know how hard it is to build a consumer app? Yeah. <laughs> I know you know now. Yeah. You know how expensive, how hard, how, you know. You know, people are raising 30, 40 million dollars in capital and failing with ease, because it's hard. And so, and so like, I, I wanna start championing, like, I think it's remarkable to be able to do something you like, have a six-figure business, because I know you can have an incredible life on that. Like, the average medium income in America is 51,000, 47,000, what's the number, you know? The bottom of the 1% wealth in our country, the richest country in the world, maybe China, I don't know, but like fucking we're in there, right? The bottom of it is 400 something thousand a year. Like if you make 400,000 a year and up, you're in the 1%, the 1% of America. But the talk and the branding of entrepreneurship and business is like 28 million, it's so crazy. 
So I'm obsessed with practicality. You know, like if you're, you know, that's what I like. I like, I like that a lot. So. Unfortunately, you're the only one saying that. You see, you yeah. see everywhere, whether it's. Oh, I know. No matter what it is, every ad is about the car, the jet, the watch. Every Facebook ad. It's romanticized. You make $100,000 in six weeks. It's just they don't ridiculous. do it though. I mean, you did, you did it, right? I mean, how do you get the mindset of everyone? We, it's out there. You're putting out great content of what people can do. And they I, don't don't think, do I don't think, do I don't think we do. If I'm not worried about it, you surely shouldn't. Meaning, we just do. Yeah. Your true stories are what matters. Like you guys can, you know, like, it, you know, once you get to that place where you're good with yourself and you're trying to give back, you only can give back in your truth. You know? Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. May I? Yeah. When I taught fifth grade 30 years ago, or 25 years ago, taught kids, I thought school blew <laughs> as a teacher. Yeah. I thought I, lived, I was in a small city. You taught fifth grade? I taught fifth grade and fourth grade. And you thought it was bad for them, or bad for you, or bad the overall? Whole thing yeah. Was just complete garbage. Bullshit. It's real bad. And you know what's really sad is that's 25 years ago. With the actualization of the internet, it is so broken now. Because we, back to practicality, it was already somewhat bad. Yeah. It now makes absolutely positively no sense. We're making kids. 85 percent of the kids in this country are memorizing information. But I think there's hope. I, mean, I don't know what else to tell you. I'm, I'm going to tell you what the thing, I think the hope is. And, and that is, I selfishly, as a 25 or 27 year old kid, not kid, sorry, young person at the time, <laughs> but mentally a kid, did some things in my teaching to entertain me. Yes. And to make my job more interesting. Yes. It made me a far better teacher. Yeah, they liked you too. Right. Because you were a kid. Well, because I would be a great teacher at 42 oh, right now. I mean, I want to teach fifth grade right now so bad you don't even want to so know. Bad. I'm coming so guns bad. a blazing. So <laughs> I mean, I you, never mind. But here's the thing. The best, it was a great job. One of the best experiences I ever had that changed everything, and I wish every young person could have this experience, and it was by mistake. Chasing the cars and the watches and the things all changed when they had this unit and it was a bunch of file folders worth of shit about the Holocaust and about this and yeah. about this. It was just terrible. So I said, screw this, I'm not doing any of this. <laughs> and we did our own unit on making kids, you know, we made blonde haired kids sit in the back for a couple days. We treated them like shit. Mm. All sorts of, make, and parents got all- And this is the shit you could do 25 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But let me you can't do that shit now. Anymore. You know what we did though, <laughs> let me tell you something. We were, we, we ended up bringing, this is the one thing and I'm gonna stop. The, I probably won't, but the, uh, it was, we brought a survivor from Auschwitz in, mm. and she sat. And the first thing she did, she has a sure. little bag, mm -hmm. paper bag with bologna sandwich in it. And she goes, I carry this everywhere because I, the closest I came to death was at 16 years old when I took a bologna sandwich that was moldy out of the garbage at the guard's hut and I was beaten half to death for it. So everywhere I go, I have a bologna sandwich. Interesting. These little privileged kids look at them and go, Look at her and go, wow. And then she rolls up the sleeve and showed her a tattoo with the number. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, life got real. And I realized what she had done was change 30 lives that day. Yep. And so I think. The problem is, and you yeah. know this, she changed 30 lives that day for 24 hours. The thing that I live in is yep. practicality. Yep. Uh, you're driving fast, one-handed, fucking being ridiculous, lights go on, you shit your pants, you slow down, it drives past you, you're like, fucking thank God, <laughs> right? And then you are kind of chill for like about 12, 15 minutes, and then definitely by tomorrow, and most likely by the end of that trip, you're back, right? You go to the doctor, your blood test is weird, they call you back in, you fucking eat healthy that day. You fucking are scared shitless. You like tell people you love them. You're like doing everything right. False alarm. Three days later, you're back. The thing that I think I'm taking a lot of pride in, and this is the internet. This isn't that I'm more special than other people that had ambition to communicate before me. It's that the reason I think I was able to, am creating more results is because I'm consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you made it very clear that the goal shouldn't be, I want to make a 
like a million dollars when I'm 25. You know, it's just like I realized. But I made, but I made it. But, you know, and listen, some people maybe you heard it from the first podcast and the first video, or maybe like 99.999 percent. It was the first piece of content that made you go down the rabbit hole that then got you stuck and then I pounded you for 187 days in a row mm-hmm. and then it was like, wait a minute, that might be right. Yes, right. Cause that's what it is. That's true. That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> That's it, guy, right? Yeah. You know, cause it can't, it can't, there's no, there's no one piece of content. That it, even like the song you heard from the Rolling Stones or Martin Luther King's, it's, Yes, in hindsight, but it's just the seed. Because far more extreme versions don't change us. Back to health scares. So that's the beauty of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to gather all this attention to keep it for a long enough period of time that it actually makes an impact. And that's why it's, I think I'm resonating. Because you change up your stories and your content and your subjects so often? to keep everybody's attention. You know what's funny? I think that is actually less strategic and more just who I am. Which is probably why I'm like, like that goes down to like other things, which is like, you know, that's probably why, that's probably why I was bad. Like I don't keep myself interested. And I'm also, you know what's funny that I've started realizing about myself is I'm a big time listener. Even though like on my shows I interrupt people. And like people like, <laughs> oh you know, like you were making a joke about yourself. You know you're gonna wanna talk, it's how you do things. But I, I'd be surprised if there wasn't some listening from it. I talk so much to create listening opportunities. Okay. I'm throwing things at you and watching how you're reacting or what are you gonna bring up, which gives me white space to go into, which manifests in a new piece of content. Even the one I just posted today, like, you know, I've kind of gotten to in the last couple of weeks this idea, and it's been an idea before, I've said it before, but I'm hot on it, of like, you're gonna find what you're looking for. You wanna find negativity, you're gonna fucking find it. Let's go, let's fucking put on fucking CNN and Fox News, let's go on Twitter, and like, we could all fucking think the world's gonna end tomorrow. Or, you could go, you could go search on Twitter right now, thank you so much for, and just see unlimited stories of like, you know, you know like unlimited stories of kindness. Like go search what was, was so kind to me. Go search on Twitter right now, was so kind to me. I don't know, you're just gonna see all sorts of things. Like it was really nice that this person was so kind to me, like, like helped me today or like, like so I'm fascinated right now of like you'll find what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're looking for optimism, you'll find it. You're looking for, you know, and that's why back to mindset or the seed or like what I'm trying to get through. Like, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I'm trying to do is take on the responsibility that I have a mess, that I'm a personality and a human that will always, has always had the ability to resonate with youth and with elderly. Like, I, I would say I do better with 70 to 90 and 15 to 25. Mm. And I, you know, obviously, which is interesting because a lot of, most of this room isn't that. But that is where I win because if you're super wisdom out, you can see through everything and you've got me pegged quick. Nine year olds understand me always the quickest. And then 15 year olds just get excited by my communication style. (laughs) And I don't really have a horse in a race. I don't care why somebody thinks I'm cool or worth listening to, I could care less. I just want them to listen because I know what my intent is and I know that I can win that game and I know I can keep their attention and that's more out of, it's less strategy that I'm gonna change it this Thursday. Babin will tell you, probably can answer. It's literally like we're living, I'll say something. I get excited in my own shit. I'm my own number one fan. (laughs) It's just true. I'll say something like, oh shit, that's fucking rad and then I'll put it in my head and then again, Bab and then Iris and DRock see it because they'll see it. Like they now understand how I do it. I've learned through their eyes how I do it, which is I'll say something, I'll like, like how it feels. Free. What's that? Like tuition free in your back. Yes, yeah, that, exactly, stuff like that. Or like something in here, I'll like the way it feels and then he'll see, I'll use it again tonight. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. For a different, and then you'll, you'll, all of a sudden I'm doing it and then like three weeks later, it's the thing. Right. It's cool, it's been fun to like learn it through the process. Can you talk about voice for a minute? Yeah. Um, got some real estate folks in the room and just how would you do it in that mortgage? You know, I think it's early for voice, but I think the, the number, like back to practicality. First thing is everybody should have an Alexa in their home and you should force yourself to do things with it that don't come natural. It comes natural to say play Billy Joel. It comes natural to say what's the weather. I'm trying to break Alexa. 
Like a lot of, like I'm trying to, I keep asking. It's very easy right now, right? It's very easy right now because it's not that advanced. But it's helping me understand, it's funny to see when I'm trying to ask it things, what's coming out of my mouth. Like when I, I'm trying to make pretend it works great. Just like I did with the iPhone, which eventually led to a lot of success for me. So I look at Alexa and Google Home like the iPhone. It's a new platform that's gonna get built on top of. Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, Waze. These are all apps on the iPhone. Uber. Hmm. Uber's an app on the iPhone and Android. So I don't think what Alexa does today means anything to me. I don't have the right answer, but like I couldn't wrap my head around people not doing things like, so you have to understand, voice is gonna work in your car and your home and it's gonna be intercompatible. So like, uh, this is real life to me. Uh, what are we, 2018? In 2027, a couple sitting on a nice day like this on a Saturday morning saying, what do you want to do, what do you want to do? Like, what are we gonna do today? Want to do anything today? <laughs> and like, one of them's gonna be like, you want to go to some open houses? Like, I don't know, we want to move, don't we? Maybe we should go look at some houses. So like, what happens in real life today now? They go to their computer and they go on Google and they start looking, right? Or they go on their phone, like, that's real life. To me, you know, Alexa, you know, uh, we'd like to go to some open houses. Alexa's like, I got you. And you go in your car and Alexa's like, you ready? And you're like, yeah, and then you go there. That's real life. That's exactly how it's gonna work because it's faster. The fuck am I gonna print something out from like I did seven years ago or put it on my phone, which means I can't then use my phone? Yeah. Right? Like so, it's gonna do everything that the phone does. Once you understand that truth, then you realize what's different on voice than it is on written and audio and video. That's all. But it's gonna do everything. Like Scandal, or not Scandal, uh, uh, Serial, right? That was the podcast that exploded. Mm -hmm. Like that entertained us. Like people listened to Serial in podcast form the way our great grandparents listened to the radio in their living room and listened to sitcoms that later became what old is new, what new is old. Everybody here is going to be entertained. Everybody here probably, do all of you listen to a podcast yet? Or? Oh yeah. That wasn't real four years ago. Utility, I mean I think, so for example, Alexa, Google Home, in the car, in the real estate business, huge from utility. Which brokerage or which macro brokerage is gonna build the best app? How are my leads? Your leads are this. What are my openings? Do any of my clients have an opening in their calendar because their calendar is matched to Google, think about Google's infrastructure. Google has Google Calendar, they have Google Home. You, all you have to do is OAuth or give permission to your Google Home device to have access to your calendar. All that I have to do as a contact of yours is do that as well. Now Google sits in the middle and I say, I really wanna see Babin. Tuesday, April 13th would be best. You both have four hours of opening. Would you like me to contact both of you? Yes. I don't need an assistant. Technology. So I have a question. Sure. Okay, so I am reaching that plateau where it's just like I only have so much time as a service based. You need to hire somebody? Yeah, and I. Or do something else, okay. Um, And hiring a designer is hard because it's like it's in your mind like design or whatever but I'm very well aware that websites like I'm not going to be doing websites when I'm like 34 years old right and so I want to opinion as someone who's been in the tech industry for a long time and with your experience what should I be investing my time in now to kind of be yep I had a bit so the good news is design never goes away okay. as a macro it's design you know it's like visual we will always look. <laughs> so it will always super duper point against. Yes, please. No, so please do how interrupt. I, please do interrupt. How I started it is I started a Facebook group and uh, that's how I got all my leads. I never paid for advertising mm-hmm. or anything, so I would just do like little videos, mm-hmm. like uh, tips, marketing mm-hmm. tips or whatever. And then that Facebook group grew to like 5,000, but they're like 5,000 like very active yeah, members. Yeah, I totally so, understand. Like, I love them. And so that's how I've been getting my business so far. So I don't know if that helps. 
any context you guys can give me is always gonna help. Uh, look, I think, I think there, you're asking two different questions. One is the output and one is the lead gen to the output. Uh-huh. Right, which both matter. So the question becomes, which one are you most focused on? They both matter, so I get that. Right now I'm most focused on doing the actual work. I hardly put out any content because I'm so busy. I get it. So the question is, you know, a couple things. One, I would scratch your own itch. The first thing I would start with is like, what do you want to design? You know, like, like if you just, you know, if you didn't have money in variable, what would you want to design? You know, and if that is as far deviating as clothes instead of websites, that's something we need to talk about. You know, um, if it's always on top of technology interfaces, well that's great. There's a lot to talk about. There's also different levels of design. You know, some is just pure design, maybe some is you, I mean I don't know how much you care about or do the UI and the UX. Right, so if it's more on the art side, we need to play that out. But if it was on the UI UX side, which it's not, which is fine, but if it was, I'll tell you the most interesting thing in the world right now to me is the UI and UX of voice. We don't know how to talk to these devices yet. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, why is there hashtags on Twitter? Because Chris Messina posted a tweet one day and said, let's start using hashtags. And Twitter was so small that the like 4,000 of us that kind of ran shit mm-hmm. were like, okay. That's literally why it happened. Like, why do you swipe up? Like, why do you, like, like, why do we do everything we do? People made decisions. They made design decisions. Where do you find the best UI UX people today? What is UI UX, what is it? User interface and you know, user design, you know, it's just, okay. you know, experience. Okay. User interface and experience, I think, is what it stands for, but like, I just know it as the, you know, the way it's referred to. It's, it's the people that really sit there and try to make things create the least amount of friction to create the result. Right. Right, how do you take friction out of the system? You should have seen winelibrary.com 1996. You had to be a mathematician to place an order. Because we didn't know how to execute a okay. shopping cart and a, you know, like, yeah. t- t- like everything, right? So the mouse is here, how do you go? Your eye goes to the top left, what colors are, like all the stuff that goes into a proper design for functionality, yeah. there's, it's pretty aesthetically, it looks right, it makes you feel warm, and then there's, do you convert? Right. There's a landing page. Does it convert? Right? How did he enter the contest that he went into? Like, you know, like, got it? Okay. Yep. So super important. Yeah. You know, like, for me, it came natural to me because it's how I thought about my dad's liquor store. Because I was 14, I would stand behind the register and I would just, it was not that busy, so every customer you could have to focus on, like, I would just watch how they, this is what I've done my whole life. I watch people. So like I would just watch how they would walk and I'm like, oh, they're all going to the beer section that's least less profitable. What if we like blocked it and made them go this way? I did that, it worked. Everybody picked up more stuff. It was crazy. Now you feel like you're in control. It's a fun job. If you're a UI UX designer, it feels very powerful. If you think about it, you're, you're, you're playing maze with humans. Yeah. yeah, the reason I asked that too, I've been through about 12 so far, and they're, they're, none of them have worked out. I'm on the next one now. And you know what's tough, right? It's even more tough with design. Like the biggest thing if you want to scale, let's say you just wanted to do exactly what you're doing, and the answer is scale. It's, about, it's not being the judge and the jury for the client. Mm-hmm. Like your designer's having to get through you before they get to the customer is your biggest vulnerability. Okay, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Because I'm like... It's, can I give you a real insight? Yeah. It's ego. Yeah. I think I'm really good at what I do. I get do. it. <laughs> and, and, and guess what? You may be. I don't think anybody here gives better marketing advice when they're with a client, but that's not what my clients are paying for. They're paying for better marketing advice than the alternative. The, what Berkshire was doing with fucking McCa- McGarry Bone or BBDO or whatever, the good news is it's way better with us now. If I did it personally, it'd be better, but that's not what we're selling here. And that's what you need to wrap your head around. So it means like 80% is good enough. As far as your employees. Here's the best part. Some people hate your shit too. <laughs> like it's not about 80%, you got it? Yeah. It's about understanding that it's a subjective call. That's right. That's good point. I'm just unemotional when people. A lot of like stress for me. It will relieve a lot. Wait till you taste it. Now it went through your head. You're like, that makes, oh wait, that's so a different way to look at it. Direct communication with the clients and nothing's going through me. But what you need to do is make sure that you don't undermine your employee. So a lot of people listen to me on this 
And they're like, that makes sense, and they're pumped. Then they hire, then they stop doing it differently. But what they're doing is they're subtly undermining their own employee because they like the feeling that the client thinks they're better. It's ego. It's ego. Ego is killing people. You know, it's funny, I'm such a front man for my company, and I have my personality, but again, like, I promise you, Babin's biggest insight will be like the humility more than the ego. Or the lack of like touching everything. The autonomy. So like not only do you have to let it go and let somebody do their thing and you shouldn't even, I mean the only reason you should approve is if something's completely off the reservation. You should even look at it before it. Only if it's completely off the reservation. So I think I watched Babin's first Four, seven, nine, help me here. Videos? I mean, more than that, but. Because it was, I was watching all the Daily Vs back then. Yeah. Took me a little while to like let go with Daily V because there's so much sensitive information. Right. Um, so, but I have now, yeah. which is crazy town because we're filming some shit. Yeah. Is that why you didn't have to be, when, when Vayner did, I kind of snuck into the franchise owner breakfast completely snuck into the franchise owner in uh, San Antonio a month ago and your team was there and they did a, I mean there was just some, you had some personalities there and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. But I noticed you didn't, um, you, they didn't feel, you were mentioned in the beginning, just in the background, Mm -hmm. building up the, but it was nothing to do with Gary Bay. Yeah. It was about, and it did have some to do with the. Yeah, I mean, the philosophy, the philosophy of this company is built by me. Right. But, yeah, I mean, look, it's even funnier than that. Even look at this. Like, all I'm real, like, even if it's me in the room, all I'm trying to do is figure out you. Like, if you're, if you have customers, it's about the customer. Yeah. Like, you know, it's important. I, we, you know, sometimes it may seem heavier than others only if my team feels that they need to use me as, in the same way that I'm trying to be a shield for you guys, like my great goal right now is to help people that are insecure use me as what to point to, to be in the argument at home. Well Gary Vee, like to me, I want people to say Gary Vee said, not because it feeds my ego, because it gives them courage to finally have the conversation. The permission thing, all right. So my team can use me if they feel like they need to. Tool in the toolbox. Tool in the toolbox. And it lets you grow. It lets you keep going. Because if it all hundred percent, hundred percent. I just limited. yeah, it just would have never been anything that matched my ambition. Right. Like if my ambition was far smaller, yet ridiculously huge, this would be what I would be doing for a living. I would just hang out with businesses and make a fortune. I make a million dollars a day. I make a million dollars a day. Enjoying the shit. I'd make a million dollars a day being put on a pedestal. Yes. And getting my ego stroked all day. Yet, I run a business that made 1.4 million in profit last year because I invested all back in the business. That's me eating my own dog food. That's me at 42 speaking about patience and building to the long term. Because you just don't go from zero to buying the Jets on a singular move. It's not how it works. Alan, I'm trying to go direct to the consumer, yes. bypass the plumber, each basic contractor. You know, it really starts off with who really is our customer. So yes. One of the one things who might. How much does it cost? A uh, whole house system installed. A plumber would charge probably about five thousand dollars. Well, first they're rich. <laughs> Let's start with. Well, it goes, it goes to, we have a less expensive system. So you, how much? Twenty five hundred bucks. Let's start with they're rich. Okay. Yeah. But that helps. Well, we. Uh, so that, we when you about, th- when you think about who your customer is. Yeah. Sometimes when you're in your own business, it's hard to understand certain things like this. Like that's a fuckload of money. Yeah. To have, like that's a really good starting point. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we were thinking about is like who's our end customer then? So who's Rich buying people. this thing? And we say, well, what, yeah. And one of the things we were talking about is uh, obviously people who have you know kids in the thing. I've got a 22 week old baby, so I'm like so good. And, like, no, no, because you have enough money. I'm trying to help you here. Okay. I don't give a fuck how many kids you have. Right. 2,500 bucks is a ton of money to the average person for a water system. Okay. Because when you don't have, uh, if you're not making over $100,000 a year and probably more, mm-hmm. like the water out of your sink is more than fine. Yeah. Delicious. So would that change then? <laughs> so how would It would you, change uh, everything. Okay. So That's why you, I'm zoning, notice? Okay. 
So how then would I, if you know, if I'm going to look at obviously people who have kids who are rich, okay. So where would I, where would I, what would be the starting point for you? Would it be content about, would I be doing content about what's going on with me and my daughter and like. You know. There's a lot of places to go. So let let me before I jump to conclusions. Though I did, and I feel like I'm right about that one conclusion. Help me break it down. What is it? You come into people's homes, and what? It's a water filtration. System. So the water coming out of your sink it's is gonna, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna, like what I have because I'm rich. Your, everything in your whole house is going to be filtered. Right. Everything in your whole house. So everything. Right. That you cook with, bathe, that's right. shower. That's right. With, everything. Well, first let's have the most interesting part of the conversation. Sure. Why is that a good idea? Well, From your selfish point of view. I mean, in terms of people don't realize how bad the chlorine is in the water and if you're bathing your kids or bathing yourself, so, well, yeah. Brooke here, she, okay. you, know, you probably go to the hair salon and spend a lot of money on your hair, don't you? I don't, but we can pretend that Okay, we'll pretend that you do. <laughs> A lot of our, you know, spouses, significant others, they go to the hair salon, they spend a lot of money, they come home, and the first thing they do is they wash their hair, right? Well, they spend all this money to get their hair colored. That chlorine's like stripping the hair color right out. out of her hair. That's true. You know, because chlorine's actually technically it's a it's a poison. I mean, people don't realize it's it's a poison. Wow. And then what it does to your skin. So if you've got a baby, you know, we talk about baby, you know, soft skin. So the the, the thing I would say is my big thing is. The most important part when you market is to focus on the black and white truths and work backwards. Okay. So I feel like the most interesting part of this discussion with you right away Mm -hmm. is where does the data break down? Let me explain. The wine business. Mm -hmm. I sold wine for years back in 1992, three, four when I was a kid, but it was the heyday because 60 Minutes did a piece on the French paradox. And the entire thesis was people in France are living longer even though they have fatty foods because there's products in wine that are so healthy for you that you will live longer. Revestrol, I think, I'm forgetting already. It's been so long since once I understood the next part, which was that was it. It was accepted. 60 minutes, doctors accepted that this chemical, Revestrol, I think, fuck, I can't remember, I can't believe I forgot, is better for you, is good for you, is great for the heart, and a lot of you have grandparents or older uncles or parents that started drinking wine in the mid-90s because it was good for your heart. This was real life in America. Glass a day, I remember. Glass a day, right? Then, six years, seven years later, which is why I can't even remember the chemical right now, or the additive, or whatever the fuck it is, which I can't believe, it makes me feel like I'm getting old because I remember everything. Uh, And this was like the core of my life. Um, Then it came out that yes, that's true, but you need to drink 64 gallons (laughs) of wine to get the benefit that they were innuendoing. A day. Right. (laughs) And I'm exaggerating, but I think it was legitimately like 10 cases of wine. (laughs) It was something no human could ever even do once, let alone in any kind of common sense way. To me, if I bought 50% of your business, 49, and we started here day one and we're about to go on a marketing plan, I'd probably spend three to four meaningful weeks really feeling if it was something we could market on because my cynicism is, you're right, but not at the dosage that we're being deployed in our water. I could be wrong. I'm telling you as a common sense human, when I hear that as the marketing lead, I'm like, fuck you. You're doing that for your self-interest. The reality is, is if, that, if it was so harmful, we would have been fucked so long ago because every day, everybody's pouring. Now, you may counter and properly with like, yeah, 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 but like the subtleties matter. Like if you have, if you have uh, what's that skin thing? Psoriasis. Psoriasis, Psoriasis or eczema. eczema, thank you. Like if you fucking have that, like it's a little, but that really impacts you. For you, Gary, maybe you don't have that, and yeah, you're right, and maybe if you don't color your hair. So I think there's a couple things. Number one, I think the biggest mistake marketers make is they lead with something that the whole industry leads with that actually doesn't matter to the audience. Let me explain another one, just to get this in your head. When Dollar Shave Club came out, 
I saw it, my father-in-law worked at Gillette as a top executive, they'd sold the company to Procter & Gamble but the guy was still there, the CEO Jim Kiltz was still on the board. I had a good relationship, I saw a moment where I could be historically right with like a legendary guy and I was like I'm gonna go for it. So I called him like hey, I just saw a startup, it's called Dollar Shave Club, they just had a viral video, I think this is something. He proceeds to tell me and laugh me out of the room on the phone by saying, Gary, we spend more money in R&D than they will raise in capital in their history. And he goes, and look, our shave is a hundredth of a 16 inch better for the man than theirs could ever be. And I go, and that's why you're gonna lose because there's not a single fucking guy in America or the world that gives a shit that their shave is a hundredth of a 16th inch cleaner than it was the last time. And I was right. People cared that it was a dollar, a hell of a lot more than they did about the hundredth of a sixteenth inch. So a couple things. Number one, fear as a lead is always capped. We discovered that. And, <laughs> Good. And that's why you flip, <laughs> like you flip over to the front of the brochure, it's all benefit. It's really Love all it. benefit based. Love it. So fear is a great. So I'm glad you're past that. Yep. Um, there's a lot, I mean it's a super interesting business. First of all, I think, I think just, I would argue that everything we just talked about is actually ironically secondary mm-hmm. and that there's just a lot of people that are willing to buy it mm-hmm. if you made the friction of them buying it easier. Okay. Just back to your first point, which is you just oh, marketing, better, just you market. Much. Look, when you have this, the mm-hmm. fact that you can target fans of the Kardashians on Facebook and have a $100,000 income and live in your town, you've already got four customers from Facebook tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like these claims or statements, right? Where are we, they're just public domain, right? Yeah, they gave them, they they were customers of ours and they they said, yeah, go ahead, use, use. That's awesome. They got our system in the house, they're happy. I mean, you're off to the races. Yeah. (laughs) Any of them actually friendly with you, like beyond? Um, I mean, I don't talk to any of them, yeah. you know, but yeah. they were, I, it, remarkably, I, all of them have been extremely did they, great. Did they say yes through their plumber, or you guys reached out to them? No, you know, an interesting thing was that I, I found a, um, <laughs> <laughs> I found a company that was doing gift bags for, um, celebrities, celebrities for like the Grammys, that happened to, the Grammys, and that happened to offer your system. And I said, yeah, let me put my system in there, and that's how I that's how I got them. Wow. That's how I got them. That's great. You make you put these in there for free in their homes for free. I gave I gave them for free. Smart. Yeah, I believe in that shit. Yeah. I believe in free a lot, which the design community hates me for. Um, hey, that's how I started out. No shit, you and everybody else. Yeah. And then when people make it, they tell everybody not to give it for free because they don't like yeah, the competition. Right. <laughs> 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 Fucking assholes. <laughs> Pisses me off. They act like they're noble to all the kids. Yeah. Hey, designers, don't give away. It's your net worth. I'm like, fuck you, asshole. I know for a fact you worked for free in the beginning and now that you fucking charge $1,000 an hour, you don't want the supply and demand to change. Right. Piece of shit. It pisses me off. You know? Yeah. Um, look, I think, do you have a way to capture the business now? On your website direct or not yet? Well, we're, we've got a, uh, a transition site. We've got our, our existing site now that our plumbers use and whatnot, and we've got a transition site that, we're, that we want to launch to go direct to the consumer. Um, we've done some AdWords testing. We're getting, the good news is that we're getting people to the site. The bad news is they're not buying. So do you have a video? Converting. Yeah, I actually got um, two different videos, and it's funny because like we talked about we got one is a benefit based, one's more of a health scare type based. So we've got both angles covered. So Understood. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of different things that are running through my mind. Um, one, I think about B two B in this sense a lot. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I think is super interesting is getting to the developer level. Mm-hmm. and having it default into the homes. Okay. And then I'm thinking about what could you possibly bring benefit to those homes. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I think a lot, there's a big arbitrage right now of people that know how to market. One of the reasons I want you to market progressively mm-hmm. is just to capture the eye of the developers in your region or, your, or in the country so that I could see something like the Toll Brothers Company default putting this into their homes of a certain income level in return for you teaching them how you marketed B2B transactions on social media. I know that's super like. Well, it's funny because we, 
me getting plumbers to, to carry this, I was I had a business model to do that, but it was getting them to actually do something was the difficult part. Getting their, so I'm, you know, the, the business owner of the plumbing company, I'm able to get him to say, yeah, I want to sell your product, but then to get the, his actual plumbers to do it is, you know, is a whole other. Yeah, but I'd want my builders to do it. Yeah. yeah. See where I'm going? Yeah. yeah. One point two million dollar houses to include it. Yeah. And All right. Let, let me keep thinking. Okay. So give it away. So I have a my, my product is a day planner for loan officers and real estate agents. And day planner. Twenty five bucks for if they buy a subscription, annual subscription, and we're do, we'll do an electronic version. It's in the works right now. It's cool. Uh, about two thousand users. Should I be just giving it away instead of selling it? Probably. Because if you give it away and you make it up on the margin on the back end, freemium is always a better model. Less friction. Is. Let me phrase. That's not fair. Freemium is not always a better. It's always fun to try the alternative if you feel you've capped out. So I'm not, I, I'm glad I just corrected myself. I love freemium. I think it's very smart. You give something a piece of value, you've got them into a recurring revenue system, they feel like the thing they got for free pays for even the thing, like, it's a good business idea. But it's not the only one. Like, I mean, you know, paying a premium, up, you know, the other argument would be to charge them more. Yeah. Like there's so many, you know, I'm always fascinated. Everything between a number and $99 interests me. I'm fascinated by anything, I think there's two thresholds, 20 and 100. I'm very fascinated about this consumer behavior that I believe. I believe that if you're under 20, like 20 is the first hurdle, but I hate, it's 25. It's 35 if you buy an individual, 99 if you buy a subscription. Yeah, to me that's where it gets fun. I love that, like, that place. There was some uh, woman that came to 4Ds and I told her to like take her $63 product to 99 and she's like made a fortune. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Cause there's just no difference. We're, I think we're very basic, 20, 100. So we've done no advertising, so when we advertise then try the different price points and see what sells. You could, you could. And then give it away and see people. I, I think buy. one of the things, so one more time, this is a planner, which is a utility for them to be more efficient, right? So it comes out every quarter, gets shipped to them, mm -hmm. and it's helping them track their time track their activities and their results so they can determine what activities. And so I have to assume it skews older because of the format of what it is? It's not, it's really interesting. But yeah. I do have younger people that are like, oh, it's not on my phone, I can't use yeah, it. Yeah, so and that's that, gonna continue to grow. actually get the app piece out, I think actually more people will buy this to help support the app. I think that might Maybe be right. They're the right thing somewhere during the day. I mean, they're right at something. And then what else? And then they're paying you what? And they're paying, well, so they're, most people are buying a subscription, so. It's, and so what does a subscription give them for 99 bucks? Gives them, every quarter it ships out. So the, the end. Quarter just shows up. And there's no other products or services? No, I mean right now we have a free like six day quick start where it downloads content to help them figure out how to use it. And have you thought about adding the level of once a quarter? Like so, you know, she had a group, his business is built like this. Have you thought about doing once a quarter a one hour, you know, virtual seminar with everybody who's bought it? We've done some stuff like that. We've got a small, you know, it's not taken off yet Facebook group yep. and doing some. What are you doing in there for it to take not out? Not enough, right? That's the, that's the challenge. We're trying to figure out what's gonna go and then we're doing like I just, we're gonna do two webinars, one next week, one the week after. One I'll, tell you one, I'll tell you one thing that always works and it's what I'm doing with you. Like if you've got expertise, which is what scares a lot of people from doing what I'm about to say, but when you have expertise, Q&A is the greatest. Okay. It's the greatest. I mean like this is the best format ever. You're asking me what you wanna know. Like, I mean, what's, what could possibly be better? Because when I want to talk, you getting that for free if you want to watch it or listen to it anyway. Okay. I would, th making it more of a community, it's very obvious to me why her business is doing well. She's actually manifested a 5,000, she's created a 5,000 person community. Dude, they give Facebook, a fuck. Facebook Live for the Q&A. You, you could do Facebook Live, you could use, there's, you know, you could do Skype, you, there's a million things you could do. Instagram, you could try a lot of different things. I'm less worried about the technology that's so advanced now. The reason I'm hesitating and just saying Facebook Live is it may make sense for you to do something else that collects first party data. Right. You may want to invest a couple, like, that, so people to call in have to give you more data when you're not at the mercy of Facebook. So there's a million ways to think about this, but I, what I think is clear is you haven't layered the high touch stickiness to the business yet, which I think will create more word of mouth and may evolve. Here's, here's why I like doing stuff like this. It may lead to something I want to do. We don't get into the trenches enough. I promise you, this is what always makes me laugh about things like this. I would have made the New York Times list anyway. 
I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know the, the value exchange on 350 books at eight times eight is not gonna be a good ROI for me in two hours, ever. And I always laugh when people like, well, say something about this or anything else I do and they're like, it's so funny how not thoughtful people are. Like, to me the reason I do this is I want to force myself through short term little fun needs to get into the trenches. This is the trenches. And people don't like the trenches. Trenches are hard. That's where all the magic happens. 100% 100% but it's but we're all trying to figure out scalability and like what are the like it's much more fun as a solopreneur or small business including mine to think about the scalable aspect versus the digging deep especially when you've been through it the youngsters here are on their journey like you and I look at them like you should be putting in the fucking work but we've been putting in the work for 20 30 years it's like fuck we have to put in the work yep oh, yeah. sure do you gotta put in just as much. They need to put in the work because they need to establish putting in the work. We need to put in the work because we can get caught into our lazy habits and the next guy or girl is right behind us ready to put us out of business. Oh, yeah. This is capitalism. That's why I hate capitalism in America in its current form, which is you work your ass off, you kill somebody, you're, it's a dog eat dog world, and then you become rich and you wanna use your money to not allow it to change so you can hold on to your money. We're in fake capitalism in America now. Old dudes are trying to change the rules so that they can keep the money because they don't want the young lionesses to take their shit. Mm-hmm. I want the young people to take the product, right? Real estate. And the internet, by the way, it's the internet that's going to solve it. Well, but he's an industry that the average age is in their 50s, right? Him and Brian, I mean, that's it, right? Yeah, real estate is a great business. Right. Like, as long as we live on this earth, it will have value. But, like, where? Like to me, the recommendation I give all my friends, like buy Manhattan, it's Manhattan, and be okay if it goes down third. Like never invest something you can't afford to lose completely because then you won't have to invest, pull out, like you won't get caught in the margins. Everything I have in Wall Street, which I don't trust those fuckers down there for anything, is completely predicated on I will never look at it for the rest of my entire life. It doesn't exist. That is why it's good to build a personal brand because it's yours in any market but it has to be built on truth and merit. And what I'm worried about is everybody's getting ahead, like, <laughs> Gary, conferences, Gary, da, 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 I don't have any money, I'm in debt, I'm like, I'm like, let me, hold on, you have $7,000 in credit card debt? Yes, what do I do? I'm like, the first thing you do is fucking sell the $8,000 suit you're wearing. Yeah. Yeah, but I was told that I have to look the part, to, like, I mean, just fucking. <laughs> Yeah, that's the other thing that scares me too is because we've been just, as a company, people know us as a company, they don't know me personally because we have such a big team now. That's what- Slowly, instead of fucking razz pizzazz on fucking Instagram, yeah. write a thoughtful six years into my journey piece on LinkedIn. Write a fucking post right now on LinkedIn tonight called six years in or make it clever. It's where I'm creative like 365, 2,000 days into my journey. A manifesto, the, you know? Or when you're writing and you realize, wait a minute, I'm just writing about nine things I've learned. So cool, nine things I've learned in my first 2,000 days in business. Post. Link in your email bio. Underneath all your information, CEO, co-founder, right? Slowly but surely. It's tortoise versus the hare, brother. It's fucking as simple as that is. What's so confusing is I have the energy of a super hare, but the actions of a tortoise. (coughs) I appreciate the feedback. Now, I was going to say that so much of the advice given uh, is finish line driven. Mm-hmm. It's predicated like there's, there's mm-hmm. actually something out there, whether it's recognition, whether it's mm-hmm. income, whether mm-hmm. it's what you're going to have. And, but you said it early on, and that if you realize that the, the win, the finish line is the journey. It's, it's over. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. Well, and, then, and then being flexible enough to allow yourself to adjust. Your life changes when you have a child. You know, he's a different man at 22 than he is at 28. There's a, you know, you can't beat yourself up for changing your mind. You just have to be thoughtful and self-aware of why you're changing your mind. Sure. Maybe the person you fall in love with is materialistic and you're just in love with him or her. You just are. You fucking love them. You want to marry them and they love shit. So all of a sudden you're buying shit that you never bought before. That's not, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that as long as you're grounded into what's happening. Right? Right? Like you're super proud of yourself of never spending money on anything and you kept it basic, but then you fall in love and he or she wants fucking a fancy belt with the logo on it. 
You know, like every, and there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Because I have my own versions. Maybe I don't want to wear fashion brands or watches, but I like buying custom Jets jerseys of random bench players. You know, that's a waste of 150 bucks for a custom jersey of a guy who might not be on the team in two months. But when I go to a Jets game and people are like, you have a blank, blank jersey? That's me peacocking that I'm the best fan. So it's okay, but what's not okay and what I'm trying to fix is you're doing it to hide your insecurities that you haven't made it yet. That's not okay, because you'll lose. You will lose. If you bought a BMW on money you don't have, because you want to look good amongst your peer set that you've made it and you haven't, you will lose. You will lose. Especially during this era right now where the market is good. If you're not winning right now, you really fucking suck. (laughs) It's the truth. Because this is not fucking you know, 2001, this is not 2008. You know how many less people buy water filtration systems when the fucking market collapses? Less people. You know how many less people buy fucking cases of $4,000 wine like today is happening at Wine Library when the market collapses? Less people. You know how many less people are buying fucking homes? A lot less people. Real life. And like, what's so fun for me is this is 100%. I will not live the rest of my life in a bullish market and growth. So like recalling, like I can't wait to air this content the day the whole fucking world melts. <laughs> and it's gonna be like, I told you so. And I hope you did something about it. Because now it gets really weird. I heard you make that comment about student loan debt. That's so oh I'm gonna be so right about that. Oh yeah. Oh, right. I'm gonna be so historically right about that. They're lending money to kids in huge debt. There's nothing else to say. There's nothing else to say. The banks are doing it again. Yeah. This time it's not bullshit mortgage, things you guys understand better. I don't, still don't fully, I mean I understand packaging up horse shit and not having a true recognition, a true system. They're like, you, you guys probably in the younger, you guys know, you have friends or acquaintances who are 180,000 in debt, a 9% interest, are making 47,000 a year and are buying expensive shit or have a new apartment. It's true. It's, a true. Model, it's true. It's going to be so bad. Here are two or three things you might tell, literally a minute, you may tell new or newer realtors. Okay. Um, so I think the real estate in- industry, I know a lot about it. Uh, my sister just became one too and like we threw a conference. Like I know it really well and have spoken Great. at, I know it, thank you. Um, first of all, I think it trades too much on its history. I think the old guard, much like marketing, is respected too much. And I think that's a fundamental starting point. Like, it's so funny, I'm talking, like, it's so funny how, con- I love how I think about the world because it's in opposite direction. I just basically have talked about old school tactics and my opening line is like, don't fucking respect the old school. <laughs> but I, I do think that a lot of the advice, ki- you said new, right? Yeah. They're getting advice from old school dogs who are saying shit that isn't relevant anymore. Right. They're just, I, I'm blown away by the enormity of advice that's like, I mean, I don't know, like, I'm just like, just like a lot of tried and true that isn't tried and true. The only reason they're getting away with it is that they built up enough of a base and a reputation. They're trading off their brand and their reputation, not off of their new tactics. But if you're new and you're 24 and nobody knows who the fuck you are, you're not trading on your reputation. Okay. So that's number one. Um, Look, I think it's complete, I think social media, aka Facebook and Instagram, especially, but I do think LinkedIn, even in a real estate world, is really tricky, interesting. Google, uh, YouTube, pre-rolls for sure. Like, if you are not a practitioner of modern day marketing, you are irrelevant. So, I, I think you're in the business of being good at Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and YouTube, comma, real estate agent. And when you make that decision, I think that's true for all of you. Like if you actually think you're a marketing company for your company first, whether you then go hire somebody to do it because you've become educated and somebody can't rip you off or you actually fall in love with it and do it in parallel or what I'm starting to see from people is I taught them to do it, they got good at it and you know what happens. You know, you're, here, you're living it already. Then people want to pay you to do it for them. All of a sudden you're, you build a $15 million agency for plumbers to market their business. 
I mean, it's real life and that's where people struggle with, do I stay the course of my business? Do I become the personality and make money that way or do I start a service business for that? Well, I'm sure this has run through, everybody's listening around, there's, you know, so, I mean, I chose, you know, it's funny, I chose to do it a very weird way. I chose to do it. I built Wine Library based on the machine that is VaynerMedia, but I'm not trying to build VaynerMedia, I'm trying to build VaynerMedia to then go back and build businesses on the back of it. Right, which is genius. Right, you see where I'm going? Yeah. I did it, then I built a service business for it with the idea then to make it so at scale that I could do it bigger, better than ever. That I could buy Schweppes for 200 million and then make everybody in America drink ginger ale because I'm gonna get Lil Yachty and Instagram models drinking Schweppes. And Schweppes will have the best voice app. And there'll be pre-rolled Schweppes ads for direct to consumer because you once searched ginger ale on Google and now you're watching a fishing video. And it'll come out of the water system from bubbles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the business model, if you don't mind, can you elaborate on that? Sure. You build yours and then what you're doing for companies now? Meaning, one more time, I want to make sure I understand the question. Um, Vayner, are you talking now? Vayner, yes. Vayner is a client service business. We get paid, we sell, we sell people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really bad business. It's a bad business even when I think you run it well. We don't run it well because it's not its intent. But even at 10, or, I mean look, it's a good business. Listen, we'll probably eventually be doing 500 million at 15% net profit. That's a good business. I don't want to pee on it, right? But it's, it's a difficult business. You're at the mercy of people. Just people. I'm in the HR business 24 7. You know, which is fine. I like that. Yeah. You know, to me, I come up with the products and service. The, some of the services are obvious, right? Paid media. Like, we'll spend your media, you'll pay us a commission on that. Like, that's under. But where do you put your focus? We did on Facebook seven years ago. So now we're a leader. Back to if I sold things, if I was willing to do Google and if I was willing to do direct mail, like, I would have been bigger. Because that's where people were paying for at the time. So, my model is bet on something you believe in, build towards that goal, out far enough that you become the leader, but not too far that you go out of business before you get there. And then my plan is to take the best talent here and deploy it against other things that I buy or start. So I'm thinking about starting a men's shampoo brand. Because I actually don't think there's any shampoo brand that speaks to us for real. Like what? Dove Men's? So, I, like, I will take four pieces of talent from here. They'll no longer work on client business. And they'll be the this, that, and the art, the creative, the media, the strategy. And so, I'm building a, an infrastructure. But you have to reverse engineer yourself. You guys know me a little bit better. You got a better sense for me even right now. This would break if I wasn't a good guy because this is completely being held up by HR. This, this is being held up on the fact that Babin doesn't want to leave. So when Babin goes and starts working for the men's media company that I'm launching this summer, which is probably true other than I love him so much I'll have to keep him once in a while for like vlogging for me, like the thing that's making him not leave is me. Otherwise he would, that was his game plan. What was it again Bobby Babin? Work for you for a year and leverage your name. <laughs> like, I mean, like, and how many? And how long are we in now? Uh, over two years. And what's right? You know, I know that you'll tell the truth. What are you thinking now? I'll be here for a long time. <laughs> you know, and whether that's three, you know, and whether that's three years or nine or seventeen or life, you know, he'll evolve. He'll, his like back to you know I'm always in the mindset of he'll fall. In, what if he falls in love with somebody that comes to one of these events? Who she lives in India, and that's it. He has to move to India, like that's cool, that's life. I'm always open for everything. Like that's, I know what my plans are, I've built the framework, my preference is it works on everybody forever, it's okay if it doesn't. Um, but that was me betting on, like this is a very unique company that's very difficult to replicate because I'm unique. But you're all unique in your way and you need to figure that out. I'm very big on deploying against your strengths. Like. Make content that fits you. Like if you're in a serious business, I was in a premium wine business and was ridiculous with my content. I'm selling $150 bottles of wine, referencing Hillbilly Jim taking a crap. Since I'm like jumping from one thing to another, how do I know that this is the thing I want to do for the rest of my life? 
you know, I think you've heard this probably about love too, and I mean this. I think you'll just know. I really do. What's gonna happen is you're gonna have, the when you really know in business, it's gonna be two things. Very early significant success, and you're loving it for not the money. That's why all the other stuff matters so much. If you're not trying to catch up to Rick, if you're not trying to impress Sally, then the, then the way you're gonna know is you love it for loving it, not for the money it's giving it to you. So many of my internet contemporaries, because I can't call them friends, because I can't be friends with somebody like this, <laughs> love stuff because of the money. They love affiliate marketing because of the money. They love network marketing and MLM because of the money. If you're the kind of person that's okay with like ripping people off for your own self gain because you need the money and you're that insecure, that, I'm not gonna, ju- who the fuck am I? I'm not gonna judge you, it's just not my cup of tea. It's not who I am or what I'm about or who I wanna associate with. I don't care how fast your car is or how hot your chicks are. Just not interested. It's gonna be fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm probably, cause if I don't figure out what I wanna do until I graduate, uh, my dad's probably gonna pull my ears and put him in his business. That makes sense. Back in and, yeah. so the, the good news is you don't have to go. You think you have to go because you're letting them have a leverage point. And that leverage is normally money, not love. Kids love to say, kids, everybody comes up with excuses. Kids too. You love to say you don't want to let your dad down. What you mean is you're not sure how you're going to maintain a decent lifestyle. It's people's inability or want to pay the price for the big stuff. Mm-hmm. Which is crazy to me in college because that's when you should find your homies. Pat, like the number one piece of advice I have if you're a winner is find three other winners, look at each other and say, 22 to 27, we're together. Let's fucking go. And now with the internet, when people are building businesses, you don't need New York or San Francisco or San Diego. Go live in Mississippi. Cost of living is low. Yeah. Go live right next to a fucking white castle that you can walk to. <laughs> Being serious, by the way. As long as you have an internet connection, let's go. Like, I, I'm giving you my dream. I wish I knew that. I wanted to pay back my parents for what they did for me. It wasn't a drag. I signed up for going there for a while, building something for them. I like not owing anybody anything. And I love the feeling that my parents and I are even, which is a rare thing for a kid to say. Especially with the amazingness that my parents are and what they did for me. We're probably still not even because they fucking really did it for me. But I like it. I'm a hell of a lot closer than most people because I really did something for them, for real. And so that's cool. So I like that. But if I didn't have that gear or that well parented, if it was a, like if I, fuck me man. Nothing's more interesting right now than to go to Mississippi with my five college friends and literally, there's nothing like building something. Like, it was much more fun before it was six figures. Those first few, right? Yeah. There's nothing like building something, right? It's true. Of course. This is all the burden now. It's so fun when you don't know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you're just trying to figure it out and you're just fucking ghetto to the max. That's what I want. That's what I, dr- I listen, I like Rocky when he's drinking the egg and fucking, like, I like that. That's why I want people to love the process. <clears throat> and it gets a lot harder to love the process when you have a husband or wife, kids, stuff. The big mistake is not the making of the money, it's the spending of the money. I want to think about it though, that's, that's the thing though. When we push him back on college, the thing is that so many of them I think know that the big companies want you to have a degree. Correct. Right, but I don't think I'll, that's, I don't think that, that matters, right? Doesn't matter here anymore. We're so, hiring a so, ton of people without so it. So instead of them going and spending thirty, fifty thousand dollars Dude, it makes no sense. Right, it's ridiculous. It, it's so broken. No, I mean, it's, trading on, it's trading on two things. Historical truth, which yes, if you wanted to get a job in 1989 in America, sure. that was good. It was a really good idea. And insecurity of parents yeah. to trade on the brand but, that their kids go to so they can look good to their other friends. I think the companies can be the actual new universities. They will be. The whole thing, the whole, it's over. You have to understand why it's over. The internet's the middle. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And if you're not native to it, 
you're, if you're not, and that doesn't mean like the, it doesn't mean that brokers, real estate agents get replaced. What it means is brokerages get replaced. Like people don't get it, like it's, it's fu- like the end person is hard to replace. Like a robot's not gonna show her the house so fast. But everything else, like Vayner Brokerage, like I've thought about it a ton through the last three years. I'm like, man, like one of the reasons Berkshire is a lot of fun for me is I get to learn it as well. And like the big thesis of Vayner is to learn it. Now, I have so many things I'm gonna do so I'm not gonna go into the businesses of any of my clients. Like the first thing I'll do is something completely different than anybody we ever had and we're getting big and so it's starting to eliminate things. So I've actually said no to some things recently because I'm like, well fuck, I may want to do a bottled water, you know? Anyway, nonetheless, but fuck man, I already know it didn't take that many meetings and I knew it before I even grabbed them and I kind of said yes because of Gino too. It's really funny, we both did the same fucking thing. Yeah, uh, is, is um, I mean Vayner, you know this too, like my brokerage? would destroy everybody's house's brokerage because everything's a commodity other than building up the agent and I know how to build up the agent a hell of a lot better than giving you a book of leads and JVing and giving you a fucking business card and you're like, are you fucking kidding me? That's where the leverage is. So, super interesting. That's the whole leverage of everything. Comms is the leverage. Communication, marketing, like that's the leverage for anything. Like as long as your product's not a piece of shit, the variables are happening in the marketing in the positioning, in the brand. And, and you've got kids that are going into math, but math is not how you sell Nike. So you can be awesome at Google and Facebook, but you have to build brand too. And then you have the big companies that don't care about the new math. And so that's where the delta is. You gotta respect the art and the science of the new world. Well, the other thing to figure out is what's gonna replace at that college level, their ability to interact face to face like a... Like a Life. The kid, yeah, they, they got a... Life. Yeah. The hyperbole and bullshit of like, I'm gonna send my kid to a campus and that's where he or she is gonna become a man or woman and like get life skills is horseshit. It's a fake yeah. environment. Yeah. Life. Life is gonna make them a man. Like, life. I mean, it's crazy. Like, when people are like, oh, the, I'm like, okay, then like, why don't they get paid for half the year to do something and then let's send them on, you'll get a hell of a lot more life and fun, like let's put them all on a fucking cruise for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're, I mean, it's, 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 it's so broken. Yeah. It's so broken. It's gonna come down, look, look, what we're really bad at is respecting history. In 1951, nobody gave a fuck about college. I mean, they did, but it wasn't the American dream or the must. You got, you got skills, you were taught skills in high school. You know, and you were taught skills, and you went and got a job. And then through a lot of smart positioning and marketing and behavior and big business, like college was able to win. At the default, for us, you had to at least go to a community college. Guess what, you still got debt there too if you didn't have the money to pay. Oh, this is 16? Yeah. You're in a funny spot right now, right? Mm -hmm. Because probably what you thought 10 years ago has been affected by you just even, if you're sitting here, you're affected by the truth. Meaning, I don't know where you sit on college or not, but I promise you, it hasn't gained momentum from 10 years ago. It can only be neutral, like if you loved it. If you were an academic, and like you loved, right, for your parents, like if you're an academic, if you were a college professor, and over the last 10 years, there's no way you believe in it more. You're hold, you may believe in the same, because you haven't allowed to hear what's happening, but if you're an average parent right now with a 16 year old, you probably believe in college less than you did 10 years ago, but you're still of the parenting generation that's caught. Mm-hmm. Guilt. I've got a, I went to school for six years and never graduated. Right. And all I, but I learned there how to manipulate. And I don't mean it. Understood. Bad, and. You learn systems. Right. My wife, on the other hand, she graduated in early childhood education, and so she is. So a product are of that. completely opposite yes. at this point. Yes. Like they need to go to college, and I'm like, they don't need college at all. Right. Um, so it's. But you're it's gonna. Are you gonna pay for college? If she go, who's the oldest, boy or girl? He's a boy. You gonna pay for it? I don't know how I'm gonna tell him no. I don't. I mean, I, I do. I, Correct. No. You 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 just know that you you're a good enough guy, or you're ho- like what you actually just answered is I'm not gonna force him and not pay. That's right. That's that's my biggest problem. The biggest problem in the system right now is parents are forcing their kids to go and aren't paying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... Parents are 
That, the biggest problem with college is parents are being pieces of shit. Mm-hmm. They're forcing their kids to collect debt to make themselves look good because on September 9th or August 16th when the kid goes away and they go out to dinner with their friends whose kid also went out away and Ricky went to Princeton. I feel great. Ricky's about to fucking be in $400,000 in debt and Ricky it luckily is going to Princeton so probably he, or he can get a job at Bain and McKinsey or Goldman Sachs and so probably after seven years he'll get there but that's the 1%. The kid that's going to Penn State that's getting fucking $189,000, $189,000 in debt, who parents feel good because they only went to community college, but Penn State seems like a level up, but they're not paying, they don't have the money, and they're making you go. Yeah, no. That's the norm, and that kid isn't graduating Penn State in 2022 with anything. Right. Even with parents, have, they've come around to the idea that it's not, it's not as valuable. No, it's not. It's, and it was. So I'm not mad at people, like it was a good idea in 78. Right. It was a good idea. People like there was jobs lined up for you. That was became the new norm. In the same way, skills are now going to become the new norm. Like I didn't. I don't know where Babin went to fucking college. I looked at the video. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if he went to college. <laughs> sure didn't. <laughs> you know, like, like I mean, like you know, like like. Yeah. He may have been in prison. Like, well, which probably, like you know, like <laughs> like. <laughs> I love this guy. Question. <laughs> <laughs> How, how does one reach their full potential? So like every day when I decide like, okay, I'm gonna cold call 10 businesses one day, but I don't and I push it myself with some of the other excuses. Yeah. Because I know in the back of my mind, oh, that's got a business, I'm good. So how do I stop pushing myself with excuses? And actually? Well, look, the fact that you could even articulate that question has you so much further along than anybody, anybody who has the ability to say, dad has a business, I'm good, you've been listening. So you're already on your way. Honestly, I don't even want to answer your question because I'm already happy for you. You're on your way. One thing I would say though is full potential or 10 calls, these are arbitrary things. Mm -hmm. What's full potential? Mm -hmm. I can't define that. These are things we're imposing on ourselves. Why is 10 calls the magic number to feel good about yourself? Why couldn't it be three or 700? Mm -hmm. Got it? So know what's real and what's not real. You said a very important real thing which is you're concerned that the cushion is siphoning out your ambition. That's up to you. Here's what I can tell you. You want to, my one man lives life where regret is the only thing that's scary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, it's probably, you know, everyone's wired differently. Like to me, the thought of somebody saying that, I think one of the reasons I own nothing of, you know, I talk, I've been talking a lot more about not owning anything of Wine Library because I didn't want people, as I've gotten more popular and I'm putting pressure on the system, people are pushing back at me who are trying to get your money and are saying, well, he was handed everything. And I was like, fuck. I always protected my dad because I always thought it was a little weird that I never owned anything. But now I'm getting into even more of an honest place, to be very frank. My most honest place, Babin's never heard this, first time I'm ever saying it out loud. I think I secretly made sure I didn't own any of it. You know, he wasn't asking, he wasn't giving, and I wasn't asking. It took two to tango. I didn't put pressure on my dad to give me anything in the business because I think for me, subconsciously, and maybe consciously after I got to about 28 or 29, but definitely not at 23 or four, but definitely at 28, 29, 30, I realized I was on my way to doing things and I didn't need anybody to have an excuse. And I didn't want anybody to say I was successful because of that. So you just need to try to get to know yourself. Are you okay with people? No matter, are you okay with taking over? So you may say, I'm gonna go into the business and I'm gonna make it 500 times bigger. You may say that to yourself. And then you may say, well that will prove that I'm good or what have you. And then I would say to you, but people are gonna still come up with excuses that, you know, and so you just gotta know yourself. You know? You just gotta know yourself. So it's interesting, so you're not letting good get in the way of great. You don't wanna be distracted by comfortable. Right. Like safe and comfortable. What kind of business is it? Um, it's kind of like Time Warner. We uh, we supply um, internet and cable to seven states in India. And is it your dad's business, or is he the executive of it, or is he? Uh, he's one of the owners. Yep. So him and his friend dropped out of high school in sophomore year, and then they started it and went on and got more people in it. Yep. That's a big business. Uh, kind of is. Yeah. So look, I think you, 
you know, you're dealing with what I'm worried about for my kids, which is do you want to climb the mountain or do you want to run away from the mountain? And both are right. I don't, you know what, I'm not even gonna use run away from the mountain ever again, ever again. This is back to, this is me and my process. <laughs> Running away seems like a negative. Mm-hmm. It's appropriate. I would fucking, if I was my own son, I would fucking not do anything close to what I was, I would try to become the biggest artist in the world. Because I wouldn't have wanted, like it would have been like fuck, it's daunting because I want my own path. Mm. That's who I am. I just, you know, with the same chemicals I have, I would have wanted my own path. You know? Mm. So, look man, if it's that real, and sounds like it's super real, you need to try to figure out what makes you tick. And it's very cliche for kids to have very opposite reactions to very significant parent success. You either wanna go crazy and build a fucking empire by, you know, or you wanna go save the world or give it all back, or you know? Not, be, not play the same score. Right. I think that's where the problem is. I have zero self-awareness right now. And I, I think you have a lot, bro. I think the fact that you're even using the terminology is, I actually think you, I think you are early in the process, but I think the fact that you even know what self-awareness is is a good starting point. Lack of self-awareness is not even acknowledging its existence. You know? You don't know yourself yet. That's exactly right. But that makes sense. You know? Most of us didn't. So it's okay to not know what I'm gonna do with my degree after a year when I graduate. A hundred percent, brother. It's preferable. I can't even like, get hired by anyone and yeah. still figure out what's going on. A hundred percent. My preference would be that you, do, you get hired somewhere where it still gives you free time to get to know yourself too. Mm-hmm. You also have to understand if you're doing it for yourself or if you're doing it for them. Like if you're getting hired because you think that's what your parents want, you need to get to that place first. As long as you're willing to live without them supporting you financially, mm-hmm. well then you're off to the races. That's the leverage. For me, like, my end point is my family saying, yeah, we're proud of him. I get it. It's very cultural. Well, like for India and Ru- Russia and like Asia, it, you know, if you're brown, Asian, or Eastern European, you, we're all dip, slight little versions of the same shit. So yeah. I've always been very empathetic to it. Yeah. <sighs> Let me give you some really good advice. Yes. Making your parents proud on their terms in the short term often leads to a very bad relationship in the long term and those years hurt. So a little pain in the beginning is a lot better than a ton of pain at the end. And that's easy to say when you're not in it, like I am, but it's the truth. Especially hard when me and my dad, like he's the one supporting everything, me financially a lot. <laughs> we have a typical dad. Old school, yeah I get it. Indian religion, but we don't and you're, you're communicating through your mom. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I get How it. How do bro. you know? <laughs> I know because because most there's only the reason I'm always good at this stuff is there's only 18 to 44 things. Yeah. In life, life's basic. I just know. I also lived it. And that's exactly what happened with me and my dad. Luckily, I worked directly for him and with him, and over time we got there. But that would have been my life. That is, excuse me, that is my brother's life. Okay. That is my sister's life. So, how, so did, did you, are you still like close to him or did you? I'm very close to him but, but what I did and what I would recommend to you is to have the leverage. Okay. So like actually go work with him or? My answer of the leverage is not to be, not to be held accountable to his finances. Okay. College is one thing. Mm-hmm. He wanted that. Right. But the day you end is the day you don't take another dollar. It's 100% right. Self-reliance. You can't allow it. Otherwise the relationship is skewed. And let me promise you one thing. That is going to garner more respect than anything you'll ever do. Especially if your dad wants you to take it. Because the other thing with old school dads is they want you to take it because they like using it as leverage. As long as you're taking it, then he can make you do what he wants. Well, he, he's not the kind who's like, Good. do this. But Good. Like, 
What do you want to do? That's, you're, off, you're in a better place than most then. Yeah. Then, then you need to be in a place where you don't take the money. Okay. You get in that place, you'll win. Okay. That's the right advice. Yeah. I mean, and that's why kids piss me off. Like I do a lot of content for the kids and they love me, but then when I get one on one, I'm like, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> you, you want the money, but don't want to listen to your parents. Right. They're paying for the right to tell you what to do. Yeah. Get off the payroll and sh- you, you're such a big shot. Your startup, fucking, like, yeah. you can't have both. Right. You can't have the fucking Mercedes and the fucking gym membership that your parents are paying for, but then do it exactly how you want, spitting in their face against what they want. Right? So either you're your own person or you're not. It's binary. I love when people, like, it's so fun for me, like, just sitting here, I don't even want to leave. Like, all these <laughs> meetings and emails and DMs and conversations I have, like, yo, I'm independent. Well, they do pay for the gym. Oh, and I do have an Amazon stipend. Yeah, yeah. And Uber is on my dad's credit card. I'm like, you're on the payroll. <laughs> you're on the fucking payroll. Get off the payroll and do whatever the fuck you want. Stay on the payroll and do whatever the fuck they want. So we're meeting here every week now? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, this, this is, is it. it. <laughs>